All right. Uh, so welcome again to this year's uh, Scene Graph panel. Uh, my name is Chris Hagedorn. I'm a software engineer. I work on our developer platform team. And uh, what I'm going to do right now is walk through some of the new uh, Scene Graph BrightScript SDK uh, features that have been added in the last year. Uh, after that, I'll talk about some more general developer best practices um, that we think are worth mentioning. Uh, and then after that, we'll go into our Q&A. Uh, this QR code will get you into the, the Slido if you want to ask questions for the Q&A. Uh, and with that, let's dive into it. All right, I'm going to break these up into four uh, sort of subcategories. Uh, and we'll take them one at a time. So the first set of features I'm going to talk about are, are what we're calling OS type features. These are sort of general scene graph UX type features. Uh, and these first two are both uh, kind of related. Uh, they're both text display type features. Um, the first one is uh, a new component uh, that we call a multi-style label, uh, which is just like the existing labels in scene graph. Uh, but as the name suggests, it supports multiple styles. And there's an example of that on the right-hand side of the screen here. Uh, and so you can see that within a single label, you can mix plain text with bold text, for example, or multiple different fonts or, or even different colors. Uh, and in, in the past, to accomplish something like this, you would have had to cobble together multiple different labels, one for each different style, color, font that you wanted to use. But with the new multi-style label, you can do it all in a single label component. And the other uh, text display type uh, component that we've added this year is the info pane. Uh, the info pane is going to probably look familiar. This is a sort of a little call-out box that displays text in, in a lighter colored rounded rect. Uh, and you've probably seen these elsewhere on the platform. So for instance, if you go into the device settings on Heroku, you're going to see a number of these uh, with sort of explanatory text in them uh, telling the user what the various settings do. Uh, but now um, you can access InfoPane in SceneGraph and use it in your channels. All right, continuing with OS features, um, Another sort of UX uh, thing is the standard dialog framework. So uh, SceneGraph has always had support for a few built-in dialogues, but um, with the standard dialog framework, we are expanding and building on that and improving it. Um, so there are still, just like there have been in the past, there are still uh, pre-built dialogues that you can use right out of the box if you want. There are four of them. There's a, a message dialogue, which you see an example of here. There's a pin dialogue. There's a, a keyboard dialogue. And there's a progress uh, type dialogue. Um, and with the standard dialogue framework, um, you can tweak these a little bit. So if, if, you, if you like one of the pre-built dialogues and want to use it in your channel, but it just doesn't quite match your branding, say, uh, and you want to change the colors on it, you can do that now. Uh, and for example, the, the one you see here on the slide, we've turned it green just to, uh, to demonstrate. Um, so you can now theme the, the pre-built uh, dialogues. But what's uh, a little more cool than that is that you can also now build your own custom dialogues and then use them within the dialogue framework. So you can build your own custom dialogue from scratch with whatever combination of texts and buttons and keyboards you might want, and then use the standard dialogue framework to display that dialogue to the user, which we think is really cool. So, so a very much improved mechanism for using dialogues in scene graph. Uh, next up is um, RODSA. So this is a cryptographic component. Um, so this is a new scene graph component that, that gives you um, support for both ECDSA and EDDSA uh, digital signature algorithms. Uh, so we use this, uh, for example, to cryptographically prove that uh, an ad request originated from uh, an, an actual Roku device. Uh, and now with uh, this component being exposed through scene graph, you, you can now use that uh, crypto algorithm uh, in your channel for whatever you may need it for. Um, also new this year, detailed type mismatch errors. So 
Uh, I'm sure you've all seen this before. Um, in the past, when you run into a uh, type mismatch error in BrightScript, the information that gets printed to the debug console is, is kind of basic. It, it tells you that there was a type mismatch error and it tells you what line of code it happened on, but that's about it. Uh, but now with this improvement, it will also tell you what the type mismatch error was. For example, it might say, you know, you can't compare a string to an int. Um, and so we think that's going to be really helpful in, in debugging these types of errors. I, I know it's already been very helpful in, in some of the work that, that I've been doing. Um, and finally, in, in the OS features category, uh, there's a new debugging command called execute. So if you're working in the uh, BrightScript debug protocol, there's a new command called execute. Uh, and what this lets you do is pretty much what it sounds like. You can execute a, a piece of code in a specific stack frame right there in the debugger. So, so essentially what that lets you do is evaluate and run BrightScript expressions right within the debug protocol. So we think that's really cool. Um, moving on to uh, media features. Uh, there are a couple of generic sort of playback related things that we think are pretty useful. The first is called CD in switch. So what this is, uh, this is a new field on the video note that you can observe uh, and it'll let you know when the player switches between multiple different CDNs. So it's a pretty basic idea, but the information uh, we think is, is very valuable. Uh, another sort of similar general playback uh, event feature that's new this year is uh, HDR mode. So this is a, a new chunk of information that comes back with the uh, stream segment info events. So um, the, the stream segment info event has existed for a while, um, but now uh, after this change, that event will include a, an HDR mode field that lets you know um, not only whether or not streaming is happening in HDR, but also if it is, what flavor of HDR. So um, just a few of uh, the examples of, of values that that field might have are uh, SDR, HDR10, Dolby Vision, uh, and there are others. So it's not just a simple yes, no, am I in HDR? It will let you know what type of HDR. Um, moving on to some uh, DRM specific type of information. So um, the first one is DRM error code. And that again is pretty much what it sounds like. So um, the, again, the video node has for a while had this error info field on it. Well, now with this change, um, that error info field will contain a new DRM error code field. Um, and you know, if for whatever reason, the DRM system that you're working with returns uh, an error code, that code will be propagated up to this field and, and you can uh, access it in BrightScript and react to it as appropriate. Uh, and, and also DRM related uh, is this new um, license acquisition window idea. So uh, it's a little bit abbreviated there, but that's what that stands for is license acquisition window. And, and the idea here is that we're giving you a way to uh, prevent your, your Widevine DRM server from being flooded with a whole bunch of simultaneous requests. Uh, and the way it works is um, this would be a field on your content node. So when you're setting up the content metadata for a piece of Widevine DRM content, you could set this license acquisition window field um, to, a, to a number that would represent the amount of time that the channel will wait before it rotates the DRM keys, right? So that, that's the general idea there. And, and it's, again, the, the overall idea is to help you prevent the device from flooding the DRM server with simultaneous requests. Uh, and then also, um, while we're on the, the media category, we do have a deprecation to announce uh, this year. So uh, Windows Media Audio and Windows Media Audio Pro will not be supported on the platform uh, going forward. Okay, next up is uh, Roku Pay. So there are a couple of new Roku Pay features um, that we think are gonna be really useful. Uh, the first one is a Dunning check. Uh, and so the idea here is um, to give you an easier way of 
figuring out whether or not a, a given subscription is in the Dunning state. So, um, and the way we're doing that is when you call the channel store component to get the information about purchases for a given account, that response is now going to contain uh, a status field and an in Dunning field uh, that will let you know whether or not that particular subscription is in a Dunning state. And, and this is, this is valuable, we think, because um, this used to be a two-step process. So in the past, if you wanted to figure this out, you had to first go to the channel store, get the list of purchases for the account, and then grab the transaction ID out of that response and pass that transaction ID over to the validate transaction service to find out if the subscription was in Dunning. So um, now, after this change, we've eliminated that second step and the information will just be in that initial channel store response. Uh, and similarly, um, that, that same channel store get purchase response is now also gonna contain a couple of uh, fields related to instant signup. So if you need to figure out whether or not a given subscription was originated from the instant signup process, that information is still is in that same response now in, in the form of two fields, one called the purchase channel and one called purchase context. Uh, and so uh, in the case of instant signup, the channel would be web and the context would be instant signup, or I, I think it abbreviates it, ISA is the actual string you would get. Um, so, but again, just giving you more information about purchases when you directly call the channel store so you, you don't have to go out to the validate transaction service quite as often. All right, moving on to voice. Um, voice support for profile selection screens. So um, the best way to explain this is with an example. So um, suppose you have a, a channel and you know user authenticates to it, and, but you your channel supports multiple pro profiles for multiple different users that uh, might be associated with one account in a household. Um, so in the past, you would put up a screen with a, a list of the profiles for that account. And then the user would have to pick up the remote and manually select one. Well, after this change, the user can now select a profile with voice. So you could put up a screen just like you did before with four different profiles on it, say John, Paul, George, and Ringo. And the user could say one of those names to select that profile. Or they could also select one ordinarily. They could say to the remote, the second one, and it would know to select Paul uh, as the second one in the list. Um, now there is some instrumentation you have to do in your channel to make this work. Um, uh, there are a couple of new uh, functions that have been added to the RO app manager component to, to make this work. And, and so from the from within your channel, what you would do is first initiate a, um, a voice action selection request is what we call it. These are called voice actions. Um, and then you would, you would, your channel would have to pass uh, the list of valid strings for that particular request up to the service. And uh, that would help us, um, you know, eliminate you know, if, if the user said something that wasn't one of the possible choices. So, so in the in the context of our example, you would pass an array of strings, and they would be John, Paul, George, and Ringo, to let the the system know that those are the strings that it should be listening for. Uh, and then once that's done, when the user makes their selection with voice and either says the name of one of the profiles or or chooses one uh, by number, uh, you will get a, an uh, RO input event just like you already do for, for other voice requests. Uh, and that event would contain the information that you would need to know that you know, the user selected the Paul profile, for instance. So we think that's really cool, being able to select profiles with voice. Um, Hands-free remotes. So uh, we are now at a point where we have two different types of voice remotes out there in the world. So we have the original uh, push to talk remote where you have to pick it up and push the microphone button to say anything. And then we have the new voice remote pro, which is a hands-free remote. You don't have to pick it up and push the microphone button to talk to it. Uh, and so there's a new, uh, in, RO, in the RO device info component, there's a new has feature uh, call that you can make to figure out which of those two types of voice remotes is paired to, to the device. 
Enhanced dictation for voice keyboards. Um, this is a new field on the voice text edit box. And what you can do with this is observe it to know whether or not the user is talking right now. Is the user currently dictating into a, a voice text edit box? And then the last bullet, uh, support for the standard dialogue framework. Uh, I talked about the, the dialogue framework a little earlier. This bullet is just here to remind me, to remind you that that new dialogue framework also supports voice. So if you're using the, the pre-built keyboard or pen dialogues, the user will be able to use their remote to dictate into those dialogues. All right, moving on to some best practices. Uh, some of these are maybe gonna seem a little simple and obvious to some of you um, and others maybe not, but uh, we think they're worth repeating anyway. Uh, on this first slide, I'm just, I'm gonna talk about some of our developer tools. This is not an exhaustive list. So there's a, there's a URL there for our DevTools website. Uh, I strongly encourage you to go there and check out all of the tools. Uh, I'm gonna talk briefly about three of them right now. Uh, the first is the stream tester tool. So um, this is a super useful tool that you can use to um, validate and debug playback of your streams without actually having to play them in a channel on a device. So you, you take the stream tester tool, you plug in the information about your stream, and it will tell you whether or not that stream will play on a Roku. And if not, it will give you some information about why not. Uh, so that's super useful. Uh, next up is Rail. This is the Roku Advanced Layout Editor. Uh, and this is another really cool tool um, that will help you troubleshoot the on-screen uh, UX that you're building in screen scene graph. So, so all of the sort of nodes and components that you have to put together to build a full screen UX, um, this tool is super helpful for understanding not only how all those bits and pieces fit together within your channel, but also troubleshooting any problems you may run into with how they interact with each other. So Rail, another you know, very cool tool. Uh, and finally, uh, testing automation. Um, I don't think I need to go into too much detail here because you, you just saw an example of it in, in the previous session. Um, but this is a tool that lets you write and execute test cases automatically. Um, for testing really anything you want to test, but um, I kind of want to emphasize right now certification related testing. So things like um, automating purchase flows, authentication is, is the example you saw in the previous session. That's a big one. Uh, performance exercises, deep linking is a very important one. And you know other, other things that will help you make sure that your channel will pass certification before you actually submit it and have us go through the certification process. Uh, so that's three of our developer tools, very useful stuff, but, but really do go to the website and check out all of them. They are all super useful. And finally, a handful of uh, more general developer best practices. Um, number one, I, I'm calling this the memory management bullet. Um, it's 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 uh, you know keeping track of nodes is part of, of it and probably the biggest part of it, especially content nodes. But memory management in general is just important to, to keep track of. So you know in your channel, you know you've got a bunch of different pieces of content, and when you're going around and building the content nodes for that content, it's it's just very important to to keep track of them and not create duplicates. Be sure to dispose of ones that you're not using or that you've finished using. Um, just so that you you keep the number of nodes that are active in memory at any given time to a minimum. Uh, and that's especially important on some of our less powerful devices, uh, which I'm going to talk about a little more in a minute. Um, port 8085. So yeah, that sounds like a super simple tip, but I think it bears repeating. You can tell net into port 8085 of a device that's in developer mode, and it will give you all kinds of useful information. Uh, about the running side loaded channel. Um, you can also you know, print to that console yourself from within your channel to debug all kinds of things. We, we use it constantly in our work. Um, network proxy. So you know, maybe you're having some trouble 
with a stream not playing correctly or you know API calls are failing and and instrumenting the channel just hasn't been enough to figure it out. And a lot of people sometimes don't think about this or they they it's too they think it's too much work and they don't they don't do it, but it's it can be super useful to just set up a quick little network proxy and, and watch the network traffic actually going back and forth and make sure it's what you're expecting. Um, that can be really helpful and it's not always something obvious to do. Uh, and finally, testing on multiple devices. So, you know, we're growing very quickly. We're at a point now where we have a very wide range of different devices with different uh, capabilities out there in the world. Um, and, and we want to be sure and, and to help you to be sure that your channels can run well on any of them, right? Whether it's the latest and greatest Roku Ultra or a brand new 4K TV, or maybe it's a Roku Express that's a couple of years old at this point. We, it's important that your channel run well on all of those. And there are lots of strategies that you can use um, to achieve that. And, you know, we're happy to, to help you through that. But the most important thing you can do, uh, in my opinion, uh, mostly just to determine whether or not there is a problem on any device, is to just get a handful, right? Go out, if you don't have one already, go out and just get on eBay and buy an Express that's a couple of years old and try your channel on it and just make sure it works the way you think it should. Um, so, and that's another one that, uh, similar to the network proxy thing, it's it's an easy thing to do and there's a huge benefit to it, but it's not always a super obvious thing uh, for people to do. So we thought it was important to call out here. Okay, that's all for me uh, for right now. Uh, here's the QR code again for the Slido if you have questions. Um, and so now I will throw it back to Jonathan and we'll move into the Q&A. Thanks, Chris. Uh... Awesome presentation. So what we're gonna do now is we're gonna have our team of panelists join Chris. So we've got uh, Kevin Phillips, the Director of Partner Engineering, uh, doing double duty, Jim Kent, our Senior Software Engineer. You may have know him from the, uh, the Voice Keyboard Workshop earlier this morning. Uh, Sid Matai, Senior Partner Engineer, and Robert Burdick actually, he joined as a panelist. So I, he may be lurking there, but Director of Development Platform, if you guys just watched the uh, if you guys just watched the self-serve cert workshop, Robert's with us also. So what I'm gonna do now, let me just uh, share my screen. Let's take a look at some of the questions on Slido. Hold on, let me make sure everyone's, we've got everyone on camera real fast. Hang on, give me one second. And let's, let's make sure. One second. All right, so we've got Kevin with us now and we've got Robert back and let, let's just get, and we, do we have, so we've got Sid, we've got the whole team now. That is awesome. All right, so let us, let me share my screen. Let's take a look at the Slido board, see what questions we have. Remember, please use Slido to answer, uh, ask your questions. Um, and then if we need any clarif clarification on your, your questions, we will ask you to use the raise hand feature. So let me just go ahead and put this in full screen. Let us see what we've got. All right. And so we've got a, maybe a couple. First thing we'll start with, actually, so Brian's pointing out, there's just uh, sort of just for your guys' awareness, uh, Brian's just pointing out a bug in the debug protocol to execute support. Uh, whenever you access a node, uh, in, e in an eval, it freezes the, the Roku device. So I'm just curious if making sure that we have that, just sort of note it to see if we can get that, um, you know. I would just say eval is deprecated really. So we shouldn't really. Yeah. Eval is not a well, valid code path. <laughs> yeah, I, I think you know, I, th I think I know what he means though. The, <clears throat> we do have a um, sort of a live compile style feature in the debug protocol, the execute command. And it's it's a known bug. We are looking into it. Cool. All right. Uh, more of a feature request. Any potential for Roku adding developer options to help facilitate using a proxy via the device? Well, I would say we've talked about that many times um, before, and uh, I don't see anything coming in the short term. 
it, it is on our radar of the request though. All right, the, for the multi-style label, does it support Unicode? For example, text in Japanese, Korean, or Tamil? Um, I can take that one. Um, currently, Roku OS doesn't support these languages, so our built-in fonts don't have those characters in them. But if you use the multi-style label, you can supply your own, your own true type file. Um, and if you do that, it should work if you use Unicode, you know, Unicode characters that are implement or that appear in that font definition. Okay. Great. I, I would um, add to that too. If you also want to use a font um, for the media player, that's going to require working with, you know, partner engineering to get auth tokens to allow that. All right, another um, potential bug. Tim Johnson stating re recent rail seems very flaky. doesn't always detect a rail enabled app. And when it does, uh, flaky at updating the view and getting a focus note, any plans to correct these issues? Uh, yeah, I mean, we, we definitely have to look into that. I mean, there haven't been, um, there haven't been updates to that tool recently. Um, and so there, there are cases of, um, sort of like browser, potential browser issues that might be contributing there, but we, we definitely need to, to look into that for sure. Great. Okay. Onto a question from Alejandro. And I, this is a great, great question. I love this. How do you think we as developers can help spread the BrightScript language and best practices to get more people, you know, via social media, YouTube, forums, blogs, what can we do to help promote? The Roku development platform. Well, I'll, I'll, I'll throw some ideas out there maybe. I, I mean, it'd be great to have a lot of uh, community support. So anything you can do to promote uh, development on the platform is great. Um, I would say too, if you want some help, um, you know, reach out to Jonathan and uh, Tom Charles and, and perhaps Roku could help evangelize things for events in your area. I mean, we want the community to do a lot of the outreach as well, but if we can support you with uh, materials, that's something we could, you know, help with. Absolutely. Definitely, we're, we're here to help. So if, if you guys have anything, just, you know, Tom or I, we can definitely help you guys out. Yeah, there are a few, I mean, in addition to our own developer forums, there, there are some sort of community driven Slack servers and discords out there that um, people tend to congregate on. Okay, question from Brian. You mentioned content nodes specifically for memory use. Do they use more memory than other nodes? It's not that they use a lot more memory, it's that they're widely used, I think. So uh, a lot of times, you know, we see a lot of channels where content nodes for every piece of content in the channel is loaded for, you know, the entire grid completely populated. Uh, that doesn't have to be the case. You really only need to, as you're paging through content, you only need, you know, what's displayed and what's up next kind of thing. So if you can manage a cache of content nodes, that makes better use of memory. Right. Content nodes are slightly heavier weight than traditional nodes just because they have all the content metadata fields sort of built into them by default. Not, it's not a huge difference, but they are slightly bigger. And then so I'm going to go with uh, Chris again for a related question. Uh, Chris saying, uh, Chris Hagedorn, you mentioned not mentioning creating duplicate nodes. So what are the ways we can handle when you can't use the same content node and the data for multiple lists? grid nodes at a time, since a node cannot be a child of more than one node at a time. So well, there are lots of strategies for that. You can reparent a node. Um, uh, I would take this opportunity to plug SGDEX if you're not aware of it. That's our sort of content management uh, framework that's available on that dev tool site that I mentioned. Um, and, and if you use SGDEX to build your channel, it does a lot of that uh, management for you and you don't have to worry about it at all. Good. Uh, are there plans to support more shapes like circles or triangles in renderable nodes? Um, I can't comment on future plans 
Um, but I will say that generally you'll get really good results if you use bitmaps for the circles and the triangles. Um, you'll get really nicely anti-alias edges because of the way the rendering hardware treats the alpha pixels on the edges. Good. Uh, which devices, you know, low end, mid end, high end, do you recommend for doing testing before submitting or while developing a new channel? Which device is a must have for our, our test stack? My, my go-to is today is a Cooper um, for like day-to-day -day development, but I always make sure to test on an older device like an Express or even a little field before I submit anything. Um, another good one to have is an Amarillo 4K as it is the one used for certification or a lot of certification is done through the Amarillo 4K. Yeah, so definitely you want to check the, uh, the cert requirements because in there it, say, it states that the Amarillo 1080 and the other, um, another device that's escaping me at the time, but it has the requirements for which devices that your channels have to pass on. So definitely check the cert requirements and th those two devices for sure have to be in your suite. The 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 lowest dense officially supported devices are you know Tyler and Sugarland. So that Tyler is the worst case. So if your channel runs well on a Tyler, it should run well everywhere pretty much. And the reason they're bringing up Amarillo 4K is all the performance requirements are measured on that device. So um, important to to run your performance cert requirements tests against that. Yep. All right. I think for Marcel, this is a question I am guessing is probably related to a, a voice keyboard, maybe. When can we have a way to force the bump sound instead of navigate sound when we set handled equals true? The scenario is that I want to stop the processing of the key press on the nodes chain because that is the end of the navigation. Yeah, I don't think there's any built-in way to do that. We call that the dead end sound. Um, and so I think the best strategy we can offer is to, to have a, a little audio file in your channel and just play that with the RO, with the, with the audio node. Okay. Uh, all right, hey, uh, Chris, Chris Ryan Parkins, you're raising your hand. And uh, so let me go to, let's go take a look and see what Chris has. Hi, uh, I was actually gonna chime in on the, the key press uh, conversation. Um, that's what I was actually racing for. Oh, that's fine, go for it. Please go ahead, chime in. Yeah, so uh, one, one of the issues that, that I've run into a lot is uh, wanting to do something like a uh, some sort of press and hold or things like that. Um, and part of the issue comes into the fact that you always have to handle the key presses synchronously. There's no way to kind of asynchronously handle them. Um, Thus, it makes that kind of logic uh, a really uh, bad experience for people who have accessibility issues because your channel is kind of throwing incorrect sounds around when you're trying to handle this uh, asynchronous flow. Um, that's at least the experience I've had with wanting a way to deal with the bump slash navigate sounds um, for some context. Thanks, Chris. That was great. Okay, let's go back here. Oops, just give me one second. I'll go back to full screen mode on this. We'll continue to forge on in our questions here. Let's see. All right, for Morgan, does the execute command in the does the execute command execute in the current frame? So that way you could access the current scene graph objects. Yeah, it, it should. And again, with with the exception of um, the bug that we mentioned, where if you're referencing objects outside of that thread, you might run into this bug. But um, short answer is yes, and the, the execute bug is being investigated. Okay. Yeah, I can take the next one too. The, yep, the I was going to say, speaking of bugs, go ahead. <laughs> yeah, the stream tests are being broken. Um, so the, there are known issues in the browser versions. I mean, there have been um, some security changes and access changes and things like Chrome, um, like around um, uh, cross-domain references. So like actually uh, doing some things from the browser to the device um, that we're also uh, looking looking into. 
Um, if the question is around the same problems in the EXE versions, that's something we should definitely investigate. So maybe Brian, if you can comment on that, are you finding the same problem with the downloadable sort of standalone app version of the of the tool? Because that shouldn't be the case. Yeah, but we can definitely investigate that. But is is that is that something that you're finding? Standalone works. Okay, yeah. So the so the browser based versions, um, yeah, we we've seen this um, with some some newer security policies that things like, for example, Google has introduced into Chrome um, that we're looking into, again, as, as our own resourcing allows. Great. Uh, let's, let's see. So are there plans for fixing the re-rendering of lists and grids when trying to paginate and push to the content node data set? I'm not sure exactly what you're asking. Um, when the content node, when the content model changes for a list or grid, it's always going to re-render. Um, but you know, if you're paginating stuff that's off screen, it, it shouldn't look any different. You shouldn't notice the re-render; it'll just look the same. So, hey, uh, um, yeah. So, Chris, do you want to expand on your question? Yeah, yeah, I, I can expand on that. So, uh, uh, essentially, the issue that that we're having is um, it, even if you've got a, a, a fairly small screen as far as data sets concerned, um, the renderers may be highly complex. And if all you've done is push a single item into the list or removed a single item from the list, it causes a redraw of every single uh, item component. Um, and it, it's a huge hit on, uh, basically it's a huge render blocking issue. Um, so it, it makes paginating while scrolling and other things like that, very, very difficult to do it in a fluid manner. Uh, this is a very common issue I run into with the, with the row list and grids to the point where we're actively looking at writing our own solution to get around these problems. All right, so the, the issue is probably not that the listing grid re-renders, it's that the, the scripts in your custom grid items are running each time. Um, well, every single itself. component is being is being destroyed and recreated, and we've, we've confirmed that the inits are running on all of them. Um, yeah, we would need to probably look at what you're doing. Um, Chris Hagedorn, do you have any, any thoughts on that? Only to confirm that we've seen similar things. So if you have a uh, row list, for example, um, that you're adding pages on to the end of, if, if you add a page, as the user is scrolling, say they're holding down the D-pad button to scroll through that row. When you add a new thing to that row, um, the scrolling sort of stalls and they have to let go of the button and press it again to get going again. We, that behavior I have seen. Okay. All right, we will move on. Okay, here's a fun one. So we've seen some speakers say using capture cards to view the Roku display on their local machines. Is Roku ever going to create a virtual machine to allow developers to develop on a computer without the need of a capture card and a Roku device? Well, this comes up every year, right? Uh, I would say we'll never say never, um, but uh, we don't have anything in the immediate future. Well, now it's officially been a developer summit, so the question's been asked. Yeah. <laughs> uh, let's see. So, Chris, again, are there plans to fix the re-rendering of list and grids when trying to paginate and push? Oh, I already asked that one. Yeah, so, we did that. Yeah, so let's make sure I close those out next time. All right. Uh, any chance of supporting multiple playback using the Roku video node? Uh, recently, I was looking to have more than one preview playback at a time, but it's not currently possible. Yeah, so we would recommend more like the pre-buffer behavior. There's only one decoder on all our current platforms. Um, that may not always be the case. We may come out with new hardware that has multiple decoders. Um, but we do offer the ability to pre-buffer. So you can do some client-side stitching of things and pre-buffer like the next ad, say, um, and get that ready to, to render immediately when um, you switch over. So, so you're basically creating a playlist. You create a playlist of different stream rolls and you pre-buffer the next item in the list. Right. Okay. 
All right, Bronley. Uh, got a question on adding new syntax enhancement to the BrightScript language. Uh, for example, ternary operator, no coalescing operator, switch case statements, namespaces, template strings, for example. Yeah, I can I can take that one. And again, without any kind of future commitment, um, you know, we we have added language features, you know, in the past, you know, even recently, you know, we did um, exception handling, for example, you know, like the try catch mechanism and, and others. Um, so yeah, I'd say I would be open to the just the suggestions and the and the concepts if you want to share with us the kinds of things that you think would be useful. Um, and then, you know, we can you know, go through and evaluate and, and see, you know, which, which types of things might, might be, you know, commonly useful. Um, and then, you know, potentially again, without committing, you know, to, you know, evaluate whether or not those are things we would, we would want to generally add to the language. So if you want to share a list, certainly share a list with, you know, Jonathan, for example, um, that would be a good first start. And uh, Bronley, so you want to? I think Bronley, you want to add on to that. So uh, uh, no, somebody in the comments had asked, uh, had said that I might need to elaborate, but I think Robert touched everything. Well, there's not really much to share other than I guess uh, you said to share with Jonathan. So those are that's a good path forward. So we can do that. Thanks. Absolutely. All right. Uh, let's see. In lower memory devices, some apps fail, but in higher memory devices, they work fine. Is there a way to fix or look up for a developer while developing a channel? I'm not sure I understand that second part, but. Uh... Yeah, the best way to discover them is just to actually try it on a low end device. Uh, in terms of fixing them, um, we usually recommend um, a strategy we call graceful degradation, which uh, could be lots of different things. Uh, it could be uh, using uh, lower res images so that you don't use up as much texture memory uh, on those lower end devices. It could be um, uh, having less complex uh, um, item components. We talked a minute ago about uh, some possible issues with uh, item components in a, in a row list, for example. If you detect that you're on a less powerful device, you might use a simpler item component for your grids than you do on a more powerful device. Things like that. Yeah, I know. Actually, in the developer documentation, there's there's some content on graceful degradation. So that's maybe some of the things you want to look up. And also in, in the recent uh, scene graph video okay. series, we do cover um, graceful degradation too. I think that is in the the third video on scene graph. But uh, Michelle, I, I can probably give you links to that stuff to help you out. Use our tools. We have a profiler to kind of identify where your memory footprint's going. All right. Yeah. Yeah, so the BrightScript profiler will give you the CPU and memory usage statistics in your application. So that is a, another good call out too. And then there was the added uh, SG nodes all if in case it was, so you can check out how many nodes you have used at this at, at a current time and see if that's impacting. Great. Got statements from the entire team just about on that one. Awesome. Let's see, uh, Vishal again. Um, I want to support splash animation. So how can we pre-buffer the video by using the video note if we need to show that splash animation uh, video in the home scene? Um, so you can do a splash animation. I, I assume your splash animation is just um, something you're rendering. Um, and it, if so, that, that can go on simultaneously to the pre-buffer. So as you're pre-buffering in the background, you could be animating something on the graphics plane. Cool. All right, from Brian, can you invalidate the default fields for content nodes or for, you know, for fields you don't use to save memory? Um, yeah, let me comment on this. Um, the content node knows about all of the, the properties that are defined in the content metadata object, which was, you know, goes back to the old SDK, but Unless you actually, unless you actually access one of those attributes of the content metadata, it doesn't use any memory. So you don't need to invalidate the fields. If you just never reference the fields in your channel, they won't take any memory, or or the attributes from content metadata. Great. 
All right. Can all rendezvous be prevented? I'm assuming no, but if no, it probably means that some rendezvous is going to happen no matter what. How do we know how much rendezvous or instances of rendezvous is acceptable? Oh, I guess I can start it off. <laughs> um, I, I would say that you're definitely going to have some rendezvous because if you're going to have multiple threads going, you're going to need to communicate to the render thread. So it's not that you're going to eliminate them all, but you do want to reduce them. And um, we do have tools to measure how many rendezvous are happening. So you can you know, go with measuring first. Um, we also have some sample apps for standard best practices, things like having a long-lived worker thread um, that, that does things and does a lot of the work and you really only communicate jo through jobs and status of jobs and have those be the rendezvous and have the actual work be independent of the other threads. Right, and there are some mechanisms for batching rendezvous. So you can set up several fields and have it only do one rendezvous, um, things like that. It's all in the documentation. But yes, you're always going to probably have some rendezvous because you're not going to want to do everything in your render thread. Good stuff. Any chance to get man in the middle proxy support on side loaded channels? Well, I think that was asked earlier, but yeah, that's the reason we don't have the proxy support is um, for security reasons. We're, we're really not allowing that. Um, okay. This may be the last question. We shall see. It is not. Why text-to-speech is only available for specific Roku models? Would it be possible to activate it for all devices? I think probably it just comes down to the capabilities of the hardware and so likely not for all devices and i mean i this is also a guess um but my sense is also there's just the size of the library the, the texas speech engine itself um may limit what platforms it runs on Will we be able to use a video or animated GIF for the launch splash screen without having that intermediate backflash? Uh, yes, that is a, it's actually a new feature in 10.0, I believe. Um, yeah, there's a new standard way to, um, to, to launch. Okay. Uh, what is the root cause of execution timeout runtime crashes? I think there can be a lot of different causes of that. One that we see a lot of times is um, that that can be caused by a, a rendezvous that gets blocked and times out. Okay, the, the board is clear. So I will give the, uh, the audience uh, a minute to uh, ask a few additional questions. Oh, Brian, Brian wants to talk. Brian Lady, one second, let's... Brian, go ahead, the floor is yours. Yeah, I was, I was just wondering, uh, since we have a little bit of time, uh, because as mentioned, there was a way to avoid the black flash in 10.0, but I was not familiar with that. And um, if there was a way for us to know what that is, that would be awesome. Yeah, so I, I believe what he's talking about is, you know, the way you transition between um, the in-channel splash screens. So in your manifest file, you'll, you'll set up some splash screens. And Roku OS will render that splash screen. And then in your app, a lot of apps will typically start drawing um, another splash screen that's just like it. Uh, in in 10.0, um, that kind of transition does not need to happen. So in 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 10.0, you can start drawing, you know, not your own splash screen while things come up. You 
you can get an event. Um, you you tell us when you when to dismiss the splash screen that Roku OS is drawing. Ah, uh, I see what you're saying. Okay, gotcha. That that is still helpful. Thank you. <laughs>